I feel a little bit of American preaching coming up in me right now. Time is on your side. Touch your neighbor, say, no matter what the devil has taken from you, he's got to give it back. This is a presentation of Alleluia Ministries International. I was preaching last night, well, testifying last night, and the altar call came up. And I began to see certain manifestations take place at the altar. And people are used to Coca-Cola <laughs> systems of casting out demons. I'm a Pepsi-Cola. God has given us authority over every demonic spirit. And he forbids it to manifest. He forbids it. And when you walk with the authority, every demon that stands up is going to be cast out. So if you want to have power, touch your neighbor and say, you better stay in there. You better stay in there. Because if you show your head, you coming out in the name of Jesus. So there's a series of things that I went through in order to get to this particular place. And it was very, very clear to me last night and tonight. Woman of God, I want to say something to you. And, and it's never my policy, great day in the morning, ever my policy in any church anywhere to speak to the first lady or leadership. I don't do those things. I am not an idiot. <laughs> but I'm going to speak to you for a quick moment. And I'm not a prophet. The thing I speak come out of the heart of God. When I was leaving last night, I went and I sat back down in my seat for a few moments. And they said, are you ready to go? And the Holy Spirit spoke these words to me that I'm speaking to you right now. He said to tell her, to tell her that her husband is safe with me. Because you don't trust people and you shouldn't. That's on the inside of you is to protect him. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. All due respect. And that's what the Holy Spirit said. So, as I was walking, I was going to turn this way to come and tell you, but they said, go this way. So, I, I, I've, been, I, I've been fussing a little bit around here. I'm going to tell you what my fuss is around here. I got a fuss. My fuss is right. And it's good, but. Not all together good. We understand time. That's what we're talking about right now. But some people are like, come on, 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 that's what he said. So I was going to come to you and just say, I know you don't know me, but I promise I'm one of the guys that would never do anything to hurt your husband. And if you agree with that, me and him is going to do some stuff that is unbelievable. But if you don't agree with it, it can't happen. So put your anointed hands on this bald head and give me permission to work with the man of God. Mm, na sakata na na mo sakata ba. 
Rokotobo Shandaraba. Oh, somebody open up your mouth and give God praise in this house. My, my assignment is not what the other's assignments are to do. My assignment is to set a record straight. To come against every force that has come against you. And no one in this room has any idea what it is like what it is like to have to give your everything up. Your everything up. Everything up. So that the man of God can be everything that he is. Most people don't understand that. They just see pretty shoes and pretty dresses. They, they don't understand the warfare that's attached to it. But I come against every spirit of Jezebel in this house tonight in the name of Jesus, I curse you. I curse you. I curse you. Now, the prophetic, the prophetic in the room is amazing. But there's a deliverance wind that is about to blow. So the prophetic is going to come from the apostle, but the deliverance is going to come from the woman of God. Grab your neighbor by the hand and say, oh, neighbor, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Open up your mouth and give him a praise in the building. Time is on your side. Time is on your side. Time. I feel a little bit of American preaching coming up in me right now. Time is on your side. Touch your neighbor, say, no matter what the devil has taken from you, he's got to give it back. Let's close. Time is on your side. Now, have your seat, because I'm about, I'm about to loose right now 100 millionaires in this room. I'm, I'm about to loose them. One, have your seat, have your seat, listen. Listen, listen to me. Quick, 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 quick. I'm about to loose a millionaire anointing on the inside of you. You know him? Huh? Yes, say, 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 Bishop. Say, 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 Bishop. I know him. I like him. You, you, how you know him? How you know him? Your friends. Say, I know him. I like him. But Bishop Bloomer, if you're going to release a millionaire anointed on him, you got to do it for me too. Let me tell you, have your seats. Here we go. Shakataba. Here we go. Here we go. Touch two people and say, from this point on, your broke days are about to be over. What would you what, what would you say to me? Have your seats. What would you say to me if I were to tell you? Uh-oh, I'm gonna get in trouble now. 
What would you say to me if I were to tell you that seed time and harvest is a curse? You, you, you want to take your hands back off my head, don't you? What, what, would you, what would you say to me if I were to tell you that seed time and harvest is a curse? You would say prove it because everybody in here believes in what? Seed time and harvest. Well, the Bible declares this, that when God created the Garden of Eden, he planted the garden eastward of Eden. Listen to me carefully. Ten minutes, I'm out of your way. Here it comes. 100 millionaires, multi-millionaires. Watch. Watch. When he created the Garden of Eden, the Bible declares that on day one, light, day two, and he began to create, and once he created the garden, this is what the Lord says. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Earth was without form, void, darkness upon the face of the deep. Verse number three starts the chorus of creation. Verse number three, and God says. Number six, God says. Number nine, God says. Number 11, God says. Number 18, God says. Number 20, God says. Number 24, God says. Number 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the beast of the field, and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. In that statement, God gave the battle plans on when you're going to attack your enemy. Anytime the United States of America is having a problem with any country, the first thing they do is deal with their fishes in the sea. They send their tanks and their submarines on top of the, the ships are birds of the air, the aircraft. In the belly of it are tanks. Inside the tanks are men. Dominion over air, sea, and land. He said, he said to Adam, come here. Of every tree in the garden you may eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden you may not eat of that tree. For the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Of every tree in the garden you may eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden you may eat of that tree. The day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. That's what he says to Adam. So now Adam understands this. Adam goes to God and he says, Lord, uh, I got this feeling, but I don't know what this feeling is. I got this feeling, but I don't know what it is. The Lord says, it's not good for man to be alone. He says, so what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to create for you a helpmate. But let me see if you can find your own. So he released Adam into the animal kingdom and Adam began to name all of the creatures. And after all the creatures was named, he came back to God and the Bible says, and there was still found no suitable mate. The word suitor means wife. So when God was looking for a wife for Adam, he didn't send a, put a harem of women in front of Adam, but he sent Adam into the animal kingdom to see if there was anything in that kingdom that he would like. And when Adam didn't find anything, then God had to help him. This is why I don't understand why folks keep on marrying animals. <laughs> Beast. And he put Adam into a sleep, pulled out of his rib, created Eve, and that's chapter number one and chapter number two. Chapter number three. Now the serpent is more subtile than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had created. And the serpent said unto the woman, Have not God said you can't eat of any of the trees in the garden? She says, Nay, we can eat of all the trees in the garden, but the tree in the midst of the garden, we may not eat of that tree nor touch it lest we die. The serpent said, What did you say? She said, We can't eat it or touch it. The serpent knew that God never said anything about touching it. He just said you couldn't eat it. So the serpent knew that Adam had given Eve information that God never spoke. Because the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil in the Garden of Eden was God's tithe. The word tithe in the Greek means tenth. In the Hebrew, it means test. That's why the Bible says, try me, prove me, test me in this and see. In the Garden of Eden, the Bible says in those days, there was no rain because there was no man to till the ground. 
The Bible says that when God, before these are the generations of the heavens, before they were in the earth, God had took trees and placed trees in the garden. So the question is, what came first, the harvest or the seed? The same question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken came first with an egg in it. And the tree came first with a seed in it, for the Bible declares that every tree before it was in the ground, God had it, and there was seed in it to produce after its kind. So the harvest came first. In the Garden of Eden, it never rained, but a mist came and watered the face of the ground. In the Garden of Eden, there was no one there to cut the grass. The grass would grow to a certain level and cut itself. All of the trees would grow, but there was no worms, there was no beetles, there was no, there was no caterpillars. None of that was inside the garden. In the garden was utopia on earth. And you couldn't go to a tree and at the base of the tree, there was a piece of fruit at the base of the tree, rotten because nothing spoiled in the garden. When man got ready to eat, he would reach to the tree and the fruit would ripen in his hand as he reached for it. Malachi chapter number 3 verse number 11 tells us that if we pay our tithes, we return back to that promise that our fruit will not spoil before it's time in the field. That he takes us back to his blessings. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In the garden of Eden, God's plan was for us never to sow a seed. But whatever we wanted, all we had to do was speak it and it comes to pass. But when Adam and Eve sinned and they got put out of the garden, God closed the gates. Rats began to form. Caterpillars and worms. Everything that is a part of the ecosystem came into play. And 2,000 years went by. Noah comes up out of the ark and builds an altar. And Noah understands the principle. For the Lord went to Adam and he said to Adam, Adam, why have you done this? And Adam said, it's the woman that you gave me. God went to the woman and she says, Master, I just want to ask you a question. You planted a garden eastward of Eden and that's where you placed my husband, right? And the Lord said, yes, that's why I placed him. You planted a garden eastward of Eden, that's where you placed him? Yes, yes. She said, Master, my husband came from outside of the garden into the garden. I was created in the garden. My husband never equipped me with tools on how to deal with serpents that was coming from outside of the garden into the garden and that's how I got beguiled. The Lord then went back to Adam and he said, curse is the ground for your sake. He didn't curse man, but he cursed the ground. When the curse fell off of God's mouth to the ground, the ground lifted up the curse and says, God, what are we going to do with this? We can't facilitate a curse. This is utopia. This is the Garden of Eden. No curse can exist in this area. So the Lord says, well, then thorns and thistles will you learn your living out of. When God spoke a curse in the Garden of Eden, the curse came out of God's mouth. It hit the ground. The ground lifted up the curse and God produced thorns and thistles in order to hide the perpetual harvest. So anytime you see thorns and thistles, the thorns and thistles assignment is to hide the blessing that is behind it. So what you were complaining about your thorns and your thistles is really your blessing behind it. So God has now got to send people in to move the thorns and the thistles so we can see the blessing. And the ground is cursed. 100 million years, here it come. The ground is cursed. A thousand years later, 2,000 years later, Noah comes out of the garden, comes out of the ark, builds an altar, offers up a sacrifice to the Lord, the Lord receives it, and the Lord says, no longer will I curse the ground for man's sake, for he's been wicked since his youth, talking about Cain and Abel. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest was God's way of placing your harvest in your hand. But it wasn't his ultimate plan. His ultimate plan was you think it and you have it.
There's a few anointed men and women of God who are not functioning out of seed time and harvest in this season. They're functioning out of God placing them in a situation of provision that every thought that you have, he manifests it because you're his own. I know it's hard for some of y'all to receive. But when you start opening up banks, when you start paying for everything cash, when you start walking into places and people start being slain because your shadow went past them, when you start operating in the supernatural in this season, it is going to blow your mind. The children of Israel got over on the other side and Moses said to them, he said, I want you to go and spy out the land which was uh, sworn unto your forefathers and I want you to bring me back a report. And the report that I want, I want you to tell me what the land has, what's the vegetation of the land, what's in the land, tell me all these things. They go and they spy out the land after 40 days and 40 nights. They come around a brook and they look up and they see something they've never saw before. They see, they go up and they cut down a cluster of grapes that has to be bored by two men on a staff. They entered into the land that flowed with milk and honey and they saw something they never saw before. A grape that can be held with your thumb and your index, they had to hold it with two palms. Huge grapes, and the Bible says and they brought of fig, figs and pomegranates. Now what tree produces grapes, figs, and pomegranates at the same time? This is what they saw in the land that flows with milk and honey. Numbers chapter number 13, verse number 23. And they brought it back to Moses, and when Moses and Caleb saw it, they said, let us go up and take the land now, for we be able but those that went up said we be not able to take the land for they are stronger than we and there we saw Anak which come of the giants and we were as grasshoppers in our own sight and so were we in theirs and then some preacher took the text out of context and said this to you you're not a grasshopper when the truth of the matter is this what's wrong with being a grasshopper What's wrong with being a grasshopper? The Bible declares that when God wanted to move giants out of the land, he would send in the grasshoppers. Because giants don't sow seeds. Giants don't plow fields. Giants only show up and eat the increase of your field. So when God wants to move giants, he sends in the locusts. The palmer worm, the chopper worm, the canker worm. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. The praying mantis. The job of the grasshoppers is to eat everything that is green. And when there's nothing left, the giants move. But National Geographic says that the palmer worm eats one part of the plant. The praying mantis eats another part of the plant. The chopper worm eats another part of the plant. The heel eats another part of the plant. But none of those locusts can eat seed. So why? While they're eating, the seed is falling on the ground. When everything that is green is gone, God then promises he's going to send the rain. And the rain simply means that I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the prayer mantis has eaten from you. This is your season of restoration. He said, listen here, I had to let you go through what you went through in order to bless you the way I'm going to bless you. I had to let you look bad for a little while. I had to let folks think that they could take you down. But the grasshoppers, their job was to eat everything that was green, to expose and move the giant. Now that the giants are gone, the rain is coming. Grab your neighbor by the hand and say, oh neighbor, time is on your side. It's your time. It's your turn. It's your season for a miracle. He said, I will restore unto you the years. The word restore means compensate. The word compensate means punitive damages, which means that you don't only get back what the devil took from you, but God is going to reward you for the hell you went through while you were going through. Pull on your neighbor, say, oh neighbor. (laughs) 
Have your seats. Listen to me. Have your seats. Anytime, and I'm done, anytime you say to people in church, you're going to be a millionaire, they jump, scream, turn around, do somersaults, flip, and they ain't going to be no millionaire. They ain't going to be no millionaire. Because in order to be one, you got to first think like one. And after thinking like one, then you got to start releasing like one. There are certain fruits that grow in America that does not grow in South Africa. I did not come here to get your money. I came to give you an opportunity to sow seed into your future. If you were blessed by this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel. You can catch Pastor Afluk Howe on AMI-TV on the public bouquet or on our live stream on AMI-TV.com. You can follow Pastor Afluk Howe on all social media platforms at Afluk Howe.